Um, thank you so much for coming today to access to uh, take advantage of this opportunity to both hear from Congressman Walden, but also to get an update about how we're serving our veterans in Jackson County. Um, I'm really, really um, very happy uh, that you're taking the time to come and hear some of the struggles we may be having in right. Jackson County, but also um, some of the amazing work. I have some great numbers that I can share with you that shows that we're really committed to what we're doing. So, um, uh, so welcome to Access. Welcome back to Jackson County. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to you, and then we'll uh, get, get started. Excellent. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, and, and thanks to all the people who are here on the uh, panels. Um, look, our country is, uh, is really measured by how we take care of those who take care of our freedom. And it's ex exceptionally important that we do everything within our power to make sure the men and women who have worn our nation's uniform get the care that they need, get the help that they need. And I know uh, the source has done great work over many years to help those most in need with drug and alcohol dependency and homelessness, um, and has a stellar record nationally uh, among the VA system for the work that they do. In the Congress, we've tried to address some of the backlog issues uh, by making uh, new paths available for health care through the VA Choice Program uh, so that veterans aren't denied access to care for too long. Uh, if you're more than 30 days or 40 miles from a facility, uh, we've clarified that you, you're going to get care. Uh, they shouldn't have to wait. Uh, in a district the size of ours, which is larger than any state east of the Mississippi, um, this is an extraordinarily important issue, especially as you get out into the more rural areas where there are great distances involved to get fairly uh, normal procedures done, and you can't get them done at your local hospital or clinic. Um, you have to go great distances, sometimes in pretty foul weather, uh, and then make a return trip. And so we're trying to figure out how to put the veteran patient first. Um, that also, uh, so we've, we've passed uh, appropriations bills to do this and created the VA Choice Program. We're trying to work out some of the bugs. As you know, initially it was interpreted that the 40-mile uh, uh, requirement uh, was as the crow flies. Well, most of us don't fly crows or have helicopters, <laughs> and so we clarified that to say it's actually distance as one would drive it like a normal human being. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, you can't make some of this stuff up. And we still have some issues about what constitutes a VA medical facility. There's some concern that a, a nearby clinic would constitute that, but a lot of them don't do like back surgery or something you may need. And so we still have some issues to work through and some funding issues, some claims processing, backlogs and delays that we're putting more money into, demanding more accountability out of uh, to, to get these done. Um, two other issues that are out there that we're addressing. Uh, one is the, uh, the uh, really sad, sad situation with uh, suicides. Uh, especially in our veterans community and active duty military. And it doesn't seem to matter uh, which you are or where you've served when it comes to the fact that you take your life. And so we passed the, the Clay Hunt uh, Suicide Prevention Act that looks at what facilities and, and treatments are available, where are the gaps, what works, what doesn't, and how do we put more resource in to help those who are, are really struggling uh, with mental health issues. We've also, by the way, as sort of a, a side note of that, invested pretty heavily to look at some of the battlefield injuries that our veterans uh, are dealing with. Principally, uh, TBI, uh, traumatic brain injury, is a, is a focal point coming out of the, the war zone out of Iraq and Afghanistan where people um, emerged alive. They show no physical um, uh, harm. And yet we know as a result of the IED explosions in the, the vehicles they were in, their brains were bounced around and they, they are suffering. And so we've got a lot of effort going into TBI research, which by the way will play out in the private sector side of things as well. I know my own brother had a severe motorcycle accident years ago and suffered brain injury uh, that he's never fully recovered from. And, and I know that kind of research is gonna play out for, for all of us, but especially for our veterans. And then we get to the issue that really brings us here today, and that deals with housing, inadequate housing. I congratulate ACCESS and being awarded the $6 million grant to assist with veterans housing. We've worked a lot with the VA uh, on these uh, vouchers uh, that have been made available, and I know there are a couple hundred here in, in the Rogue Valley. Um, we had a bit of a hiccup in Central Oregon getting the program going, uh, even though it was funded and all, but we, we worked our way through that. 
um, not without a lot of frustration, I would tell you, but we got it going. And uh, it's been very helpful. But I know as our economy has begun to, to improve uh, here and in Central Oregon, access to housing becomes a greater issue and affordability becomes a greater issue. And I know here especially there are months long waiting lists for uh, especially seniors and others who need access to affordable uh, and decent living uh, facilities. So today I just I wanted to come by and, and first congratulate Access for all the great work they do. I've been an honorary board member uh, for many years, uh, but that's sort of entitled only. I haven't been lifting boxes or, or doing whatever all you do, but I'm a big advocate. Um, but I wanted to hear what you're all running into, where we can be of assistance, what's working, what's not working, uh, where the gaps are, and, uh, and I guess add to my to-do list of okay. things. But I, I think we have to keep in the forefront the veteran and what does that man or woman need and then how do we go take care of that with all the constraints we all operate under. So with that, David, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you or however you want to uh, We're gonna run this for here. And uh, thank all of you for coming out and I'm sure it will be opportunity for all of us to interact as well. But thank you. Thank you. We haven't really made a huge plan about what we're going to do today, but we did um, bring in some people who are um, all coming together to, like we were talking about, to end veteran homelessness in Jackson County. Uh, over to my right, um, we have Michael, Tamara, and myself who are representing the support services for veteran families um, here in Jackson County. And as uh, Cong Congressman Walden mentioned, we did receive a $6 million grant in April to end veteran homelessness. Uh, we're supposed to do it by the end of this year, but we have the grant for three years so that we can keep our veterans housed once they are housed. Um, just quickly, Access has had this grant since 2012, um, so we have a lot of experience in what we're doing in Jackson County. Um, so what I want to do now just quickly is to share with you some of the numbers that I pulled today about uh, how we've been doing for the last fiscal year and then okay. also since we started the P1 grant. Uh, all right. Last fiscal year, uh, we helped 218 households in Jackson County. Uh, that's about 306 individuals. Uh, so, you know, three, 306 individuals, we're talking about children, husband, wives, partners. Uh, but 218 households received some help um, in finding their housing, uh, getting into housing, or being prevented from losing their housing. Since we did start a P1, which is the $6 million grant, which happened April 1st, we've actually helped 191 of those households. Yes. Uh, so we've expanded a lot um, because we've had this money. We have many more case managers. We have peer mentors. And because we've all come together and we do have the experience, um, 191 households have been worked with um, since April 1st, so in the last six months. So very, very wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's impressive numbers. I saw it this morning and my head spun like a cartoon character. Um, anyway, um, um, so the VA also, SSVF, uh, has required us to create a master list. Um, so we're, we're charged with going out into the community and, and literally talking to every homeless veteran that we can find and putting them on this master list. And from this master list, we then prioritize um, on need. And then based on need, we can determine the number and, or the order in which we can help a veteran or a veteran's family. Um, so right now, um, my understanding is that we had uh, 368 veterans contact us. Um, 368 veterans contact us. Now, all, not all of them are going to be eligible. Uh, some of them called from the East Coast and wanted to, uh, you know, move to Jackson County. <laughs> you know, um, some of them were, are losing their housing um, and not rental, so we could connect them with our housing programs. Uh, but 368 people, um, veterans, have called us. And um, out of those, we have a master list of 145 um, who are potentially eligible. Uh, and when I look back at the numbers we've done in the last six months, this is so doable. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is so doable. And, and we might be able to stand up at the end of December and say we ended wow. veteran homelessness uh, at the end of 2015. Um, so that would be really impressive. It's huge. Yeah, it is huge. Well um, so I'm going to just take a moment, um, and I'm going to see if we want to hear something from Michael a little, a little bit about being a case manager and helping our veterans. And then we have a new position, which is our housing specialist, Tamara, 
um, whose main goal is to go out to our community and find the landlords who want to participate with us. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll hand it over to you. You want me to come up to there or speak on the table? Okay. Speak. <laughs> <laughs> I know how that works. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, yeah. My name is Michael Swick. I am a case manager for the SSBF grant, and I work with Rogue Valley Veterans and uh, Community Outreach, Revco for short. Um, we are a contracted partner with Access, we, so we administer the grant along with Access, and uh, um, we have our own case managers and peer mentors and an eligibility specialist. Um, since the uh, the P1 funds, that's the $6 million David was referring to, has, uh, since we got that, you know, we've, we've uh, been able to increase our, uh, our head counting. We've hired uh, two, uh, one more case, we've hired two more case managers, and now one of the biggest uh, things, improvements, I think, to our program is we've hired peer mentors, and that's similar to what they call peer support people at the Veterans Administration. And what it is, is it's, it's veterans uh, that work, they partner with us, and they actually are able to, they go out in the community and they help our veterans, you, you know, identify housing. Uh, they'll take the veterans to uh, meetings with landlords, help them apply for places, because a lot of our clients have some significant barriers to housing, whether it's, uh, you know, a spotty rental history or bad credit or um, uh, criminal, uh, criminal records. And so a lot of times, you know, uh, you mentioned the, the, um, the, the rental, uh, va the vacancy rate for rentals in this county is I think 1.4% right now, which wow. is really low. So whenever, uh, whenever a property becomes wow. available, there's this huge competition to, uh, you know, to, to get somebody approved to move into it. And so, you know, we've been approaching that a couple different ways. One of the things that really helps is if we have a peer mentor go out and take our veteran, our veteran family into the community, meet with the landlords, mm -hmm. do sort of a soft handoff and introduction. They can explain our program and how it assists the veteran. And it can also help the veteran if they have, you know, they may, they may have some uh, social anxiety issues or whatnot, and it can really uh, help them. It, it help, it, it, I've seen it happen repeatedly where it helps our veterans get approved and move into a place. Um, and uh, also, uh, one of the other things we've been trying to do is, and Tamara will talk more about this in a moment, but uh, we're trying to develop, identify landlords and develop relationships with them where we can actually have first dibs on places when they become available. Like my, ideally, my perfect situation is when a, uh, I uh, am talking to a landlord and they have a place that's gonna become available and it doesn't even go on Craigslist or anything. You know, I can present some veterans uh, to apply for it and hopefully get them in the housing. And that's been really effective with helping us, uh, you know, get through a lot of the, the static and the, uh, the challenges and the barriers that come up. Uh, so those are a couple of things. You know, I know we've been talking about some other things like uh, developing landlord incentives. I don't know really what that looks like yet, but, you know, there, there's other things we can do too. But like right now, as like David was saying, you know, we're aggressively trying to end veteran homelessness in Jackson County. Uh, by the end of this year and at least get it to the functional zero mm -hmm. uh, where uh, where we you know we make so. a significant dent in that master list um, and, uh, and and really get it down there and I think things like those those these those kind of tools are what are really going to help us uh, achieve that uh, as far as the case management goes you know our our goal is not only to get veterans housed but also once they're in our program, we want to have them set up to be stable and independent so when they exit our program, they can remain housed, you know what I mean? Because it looks great to get them, you know, as a statistic, we get them uh, housed, but, you know, if they exit our program in, in three to eight months or whatever, and they're not set up to, to remain stable afterwards, whether that's either self-supporting or we transition them to another program like VASH, which uh, we work with the VA quite a bit with uh, transitioning. Uh, we've, we, we work with the VASH department to identify veterans that are good candidates for, for VASH assistance, which is the HUD VASH voucher. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we've had a lot of success with transferring veterans off of the SSVF program and then to, to VASH assistance. Uh, other ways we can support them is, you know, we help our veterans with uh, either uh, getting back into the job market, um, helping them do job searches. I've helped veterans with, you know, getting their resume together. Some, oh, some of my clients haven't looked for work in a long time. You know, they've either been in treatment or, or they've been, you know, out, uh, you know, camping or homeless or not really in touch with society and 
uh, you know, with the, the, the rhythm of, you know, just having a, a normal job and a normal day-to-day -day existence. So, um, you know, we, we help our veterans with that. Also, we can, if, uh, once we get a veteran housed, and our, it is a housing first model, so with our program, the first priority is to get a roof over our veteran or the veteran family's heads, get them housed, then we work with the other issues. And, you know, some of the other ways, uh, that we, we've helped them is you know, if they're applying for benefits or they're trying to get their benefits increased so they can be fin more financially stable in the Exeter program, that's another thing. I don't help so much myself with that, but I, I refer out to other community, prop communi community partners that can help with that. So um, those are some of the things that are going on. It's a really exciting time to be, to be working in this field with this grant right now. And, uh, and you know, the satisfaction of actually uh, you know, getting a veteran that's, that's uh, you know, been camping off the freeway in Ashland or Medford for the last, you know, yeah. year to 10 years yeah. uh, to, to actually, you know, make contact with them, develop a relationship, get them housed. Uh, it's, it's really, really satisfying. Um, and uh, again, like the peer mentors have been really instrumental with that because they can actually go out to the homeless camps. They can go to the places where the veterans congregate, uh, where, you know, the homeless ones that are hard to contact. Um, you know, some of them don't, they won't come in and seek services from us. We have to kind of go out and market to them and, and, and you know, explain it to them, gain their trust. And, uh, you know, I think uh, the, the, the way that, uh, that our, uh, our system is coming together now, uh, you know, specifically like with the peer mentors, I said, is, is really, it, it's helped immensely. And I see it continuing to be nothing but, but, you know, an advantage. It's a very, very good tool for us. So that's kind of the five minute overview of what's going on right now. Um, I'm sure you may have questions later, but thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm next, I guess. Um, I was hired about 90 days ago to be the landlord liaison for the okay. program. So I'm the one who goes out and uh, sells the product to the landlords. Um, one day I did a count off of Craigslist and approximately 4% of what's on Craigslist is affordable to this program. Um, I've just moved back to the Valley after many years away and I'm surprised myself at how many vacation rentals, vacation rental by owner, furnished rentals have taken the uh, product off the shelf for not only our vets but entry level people that are wor worker bees in the Valley. Mm -hmm. So you've got um, 20% of Craigslist is also vacation rentals probably. And it's the wine industry, it's the theater and all the other stuff that takes that away from the people that work here. So that's a challenge. Um, also our pricing is very high in the valley. It's a landlord's market. So oftentimes I'm asking people to, and we have great, um, people are calling in, landlords are calling in, they want to help. The, the, mm -hmm. the gut gauge reaction to our program is very good. However, um, Sometimes the landlords have to accept much less in rent to serve our veterans than they would to the open market. And that's not bad if it's a, you know, a hundred bucks or maybe a hundred and a quarter, but if it's higher than that, that's a significant punch in the gut. And then they, they cannot help us. And part of that is that what I'm really looking for is people that have an older mortgage or something. They, had, they didn't refinance eight years ago. Their, their mortgage is not high so that they can accept what we can afford to pay. Um, I was in D.C. last week for the National Coalition of Homeless Veterans with five of my team, including David. Um, I met, and this is your state, I met people from Beaverton, Portland, Eugene, Roseburg, Grants Pass, and us. And there were five of us that went. Um, one of the guys that was behind me in the buffet line was uh, John Kuhn, who's the National Director of Homeless Prevention Department of Veterans Affairs. He was surprised that Oregon had such a presence, and I told him Oregon has a tough time. So. Um, they're aware of us. Um, the landlords that I have contacted, I have actually been on presentations or at least had lengthy phone calls and I feel like I have a relationship with 81 landlords. So I've been out to visit <coughs> probably 70 of those. Um, I've contacted about 2,000 non-owner occupied property owners in the Valley by postcard right now asking them, and these are property owners all over the country that don't live here, that mm. own something here. So we're contacting them by mail. Um, 
so I'm just trying to build up the numbers. I, I have to say that I wish I had housed more people with these contacts that I've made so far, but a lot of people that are willing um, want to help us in January or February when their tenants move out. Can't do it now. I have three that I've met Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week that will be open the first week of November, so that's exciting. But I'm always wanting to do more. Hmm. Very good. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you. Um, so one thing that I'm really proud of here in Jackson County is our relationship with the VA. Mm -hmm. um, I can go across the country and we find yep. other organizations who uh, are having a hard time even crossing the boundary of, of the VA, so to speak. Um, but we have our, you know, White City right down the street Source. and um, we're all working closely together to fill in the gaps of what we can't do. So I thought it was really important to bring our VA um, staff to come talk about the programs. And then I also have Linda Chase because she's representing the uh, employment, the veteran employment program through the Easter sales program, not the Easter, through Easter sales. So I wanted her to talk about how we're helping our veterans um, find work um, so they can sustain their housing. So I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, so I'm Devin Shea. I am the Grant Per Diem coordinator um, out of the VA source. And so um, Grant Per Diem is a transitional housing program for homeless veterans. Um, it can be an up to two year housing program Currently in this valley, we have 52 grant per diem beds. Um, they are held by two nonprofit agencies, Salvation Army Hope House and Monroe Valley Veterans and Community Outreach. Um, between the two programs, fortunately, we're able to house any type of um, veteran that comes our way. So women veterans, um, veterans with families, and also male veterans. Um, grant per diem is a program that's based on individual need. Um, and again, it is temporary, and so it's a good fit for us to use along with the other programs we have, such as VASH or SSVF. Um, I am also the SSVF point of contact locally, um, which just came my way. But um, so it gives me a really great opportunity to work and consult with pretty much the continuum of care um, mm -hmm. and be on, on a local level with those um, who are providing those services locally. Um, I work alongside with HUD VASH and as well as our HCHB program, and I'll let them kind of talk a little bit about what we're going on. Before you do that, yes. just for those of us that are, don't have memorized every acronym. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I hear this a lot. SSBF. Supported Services for Veteran Families. So Thank that's you. the grant that Access was yeah. allocated, um, the $6 million grant. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. history on VASH very briefly. Uh, in 2008, we started with 35 vouchers, and we're currently, as of this year, up to 384 vouchers. Um, not all of them are currently full, but we are working on that. Um, like uh, the people over here were saying access, they, we work really closely with them um, and Revco and many, many, many other community partners. Um, to come together to do whatever we can for the veterans. Um, I mean, there's there's meetings monthly. There's all kinds of things to coordinate um, different um, different things um, with the SSBF uh, and Grant Per Diem and all the programs. Uh, if they have a veteran that they believe would be appropriate for HUD Bash, then they refer to us, and then we do an assessment to see if they qualify for our program. And HUD BASH, actually, talking of acronyms, is um, um, Housing and Urban Developments, Veterans uh, Administration Supported Housing is what that stands for. So um, we started out with, like I said, the 35 vouchers in Jackson County. We now have our 384 for Jackson, Josephine, Klamath, and Lake Counties. So we've spread um, out this quite a bit. Um, it's based at the, or through the VA, through this VA, we um, have an employee over in Klamath County that manages that, but he's still part of our VA program. Um, I'm not sure what else to say. Our, our barriers are very similar to what they're saying. I don't know that I could add on that. I mean, the, the, um, 
availability of affordable housing for the veterans is just very difficult. Uh, we also have housing specialists in our program that are meeting with the landlords, and I believe they meet with your uh, housing specialists also, and so that we can work together, uh, going out and meeting landlords, um, you know, talking to them about our program if they're unfamiliar. Uh, part of our job at times is convincing a landlord why they should work with us and uh, rent to a veteran that maybe is low income or has other, many other barriers. And you know, one of the points that I like to kind of push with them is that, you know, if you just rent to somebody, you know, that off the street, you're just running to that person. But this way you actually get a case manager also that could help with issues if something comes up and maybe, you know, avert a, a problem that would possibly end up having the person evicted, you know, by working with us. Just gives us somebody else, as the landlord, somebody else. Um, I think that's about it. I'm currently the Healthcare for Homeless Veterans Program Coordinator at the VA. Um, my nameplate says VASH. I'll be transitioning into a supervisory position in VASH, but I'm still currently um, Healthcare for Homeless Veterans. And what that program does um, is really responsible for kind of entry level, um, finding the veterans in the community, on the streets, um, in the homeless camps, um, really identifying the veterans in need in our community, and getting them enrolled in healthcare, getting them services that they need, and then getting, um, creating a housing plan with them to get them um, moved into housing. So this position, um, it's vital to have good community partnership. And that's um, a blessing that we have, and it's made my job very fun um, and rewarding, working with all of the community partners. Everyone works together so well. Um, and we meet the veteran where they are, and we refer them to each other, um, depending on what their need is um, at the moment. One example is I, I met a veteran, I do homeless camp sweeps with the local police. Um, they are charged with the task of um, getting tickets to homeless people, and they recognize that that's you know, what they have to do, but they don't want to keep giving tickets to the same homeless people, so they invite social workers like me out um, to, to participate in that with them and try to get that person into resources and into housing. Um, so that's what we do and one veteran wanted to start with access and so um, probably still quite a bit of alcohol in his system. He showed up at access and access did a wonderful job of meeting this veteran's needs and figuring out what he needed. Um, a peer mentor was able to help that veteran get into substance abuse treatment at the VA with a warm handoff, guiding him the entire way. Um, the VA brought him in, will give him the treatment he needs to get stable, and then he'll move into housing, probably through SSVF and possibly HUD bash um, So we have great community partnerships, and that's what it takes. Everybody um, pitches in and really meets that veteran where they are and gets them through whatever systems and resources they need. Um, so that, that makes my fun, my job incredibly fun and rewarding. Um, and the veterans really appreciate it, they recognize it. Uh, the ones that have been in the community for a while are really getting to know the community partners, the community partners know the veterans. Um, those 145 <coughs> veterans on that master list um, that David talked about for the SSVF grant, uh, we all provide names for that master list. Veterans provide their own name as well. And we're working together to um, really get those veterans housed, uh, whatever avenue it is, wherever they are in their life. And um, we do have, HUD BASH is not, uh, they're not required to be clean and sober. It's a housing first and harm reduction model. So, so when a veteran is able and willing to go to treatment, we, we try to get them in treatment. We try to get them really solid and ready for housing. Sometimes they're not willing to go to treatment or it's, it's just not their pattern. One example, I met a veteran, a Vietnam veteran, on the homeless camp sweep, and um, he stayed in touch with me for six months. He did not want to go into treatment. He didn't want to go into some stabilization contract beds I have with the Addiction Recovery Center, although he would go visit them, stay in touch, sometimes use their laundry facility. Um, and from this, we were able to get him straight from the street, from homelessness, where he preferred to be, rather than be in a, a communal living environment, right into Hudbash. And he's been housed now for 
close to a year successfully. Um, he's doing very well. So it's a, it's a wonderful <coughs> program. A lot of progress has been made in this community, and I think a lot of veterans um, feel it. We also do things like uh, for the Healthcare for Homeless Veterans program, um, coordinating or participating in the homeless stand downs in Klamath, Jackson, and Josephine County, and all of the community partners um, have participated in that, and everyone from the VA. It's a big community event where we really reach out to homeless veterans. RBTD, our local bus system, provides free transportation to get them out there and back. Um, we have buses and vans going to pick people up from different areas of different counties. So we work really hard to, to bring them into the fold and get them engaged in services. And it does take outreach. It takes getting out there on the streets and meeting these veterans and letting them know that you care. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a special relationship when you get out there and they see you coming out to their environment and building that trust. Um, and creating that bridge for them to get into services or back into services um, and guiding them along the way uh, because it's scary to not know how to navigate the systems, not know where to start, not know who to contact. It's overwhelming to someone who's on the street. Um, and I think our community does an amazing job of that street outreach and providing that guidance and warm handoffs with each other to really help. Thank Access, David Mulig and Jackie Schaaf for allowing me this opportunity to come meet and speak with Congressman Walden. Thank you so much. My name is Linda Chase and I'm with Easter Seals, Oregon, HVRP program, which is Homeless Veterans Reintegration Program. Um, it's veteran specific <coughs> employment program where we assist the veteran with finding uh, gainful employment. Um, it works very well with SSVF as one of their components is uh, as Michael Swig pointed out, that um, they would need to have an income to support themselves once they're uh, stable and established and off the street, and that's where we come in. We get a lot of referrals from um, Revco and from Access, as well as the VA. We work very closely with them um, to help uh, the veteran get employed so that they become more stable. <coughs> um, we uh, help them with resume building, um, we've had uh, 126 veterans assessed and out of those 126 we were able to enroll 97 and um, we've had a 57% success rate with keeping them employed up <coughs> and past six months. Uh, a couple of our successes are here in the audience today. We're very proud of them. Um, they came to us for assistance and we were able to help them with resume building, job referrals, uh, interview clothing, bus passes, gas cards, whatever it is, whatever that barrier is to them becoming employed, um, we are there to step in and help them do that. Uh, we keep them uh, enclosed with other uh, employment agencies, um, WorkSource Oregon uh, and Job Council, who is now ResCare, uh, with uh, the help of our DVOP, Chuck Hanger. Uh, they have a great team around them that, that for whatever their need is, once they approach us, we address that need, we help them overcome it, and hopefully get them on their feet. Um, part of our process is to refer them to Access and to Revco for housing. Uh, a lot of them come from the VA, um, and they have, have yet to receive their HUD bash. Of course, that's one thing we ask them, have you signed up for HUD bash? If they haven't, then we refer them out there to do that. Um, because we want to make them clear. Uh, we want to take them from wherever they're coming from. And, and like Michael had, had mentioned as well, that some of these veterans, for whatever reasons, have not had employment for, uh, we had a gentleman come in and he said, I haven't been employed for six years. I said, it's okay, we're gonna, we're gonna work on what you have. And we managed to get him gainfully employed and he is still employed to this day. So <coughs> we know it works um, as long as they know that, that they're not being judged, that we're meeting them where they're at and helping them to become a better person. Uh, whatever their goals are, that's what we're gonna help them do is reach those goals. I just wanna highlight kind of a theme that I've heard mm -hmm. just sitting here too, and, and really um, just put a voice to the fact that 
the work we do together and us having collaborative relationships across the board is really what pro provides so many successes yes. in this community. Yes, um, I think it's a very unique thing that this community has mm -hmm. going for it. Um, we do all face a lot of barriers and the similar barriers. It really, it's only when we work together and understand each other's role and um, the resources that are out there that we're able to actually have some of these successful outcomes. And so I think, you know, that is just one of the things that I consistently am so grateful for is the relationships we have and, and the power of that relationship building and that collaboration throughout the, our community and what it does for the individual veterans and really how it makes it easier to access, warm handoffs happen, um, there's someone with them throughout every phase of the process. And we also have such a variety of services that when we see a veteran, we can really meet them where they're mm -hmm. at and get them to where they need to enter the system. Yeah. Good, good. Given your insight, yeah. One of the things that uh, it's very, I think we all talked about and what Devin just spoke about, and it's a very simple goal. Uh, and, and that is really, we want to do everything we can to give veterans a home they deserve. It's that simple. Um, and so I want to kind of end with that. Um, if you are currently working on SSBF or the VA to help in homelessness, will you stand up, please? Yeah, yeah very good. good. Very good. I want to thank all of you for coming in and representing the work that you do. Um, so I'm open up for questions. Sure. Um, yeah. If anyone from the audience has questions or if you want to ask more Maybe I could ask one just off the, the top. Um, this is amazing. The collaboration is very powerful, obviously, in the community. And, and the fact that you can probably achieve your goal by the end of the year is huge and, and good to know. What are the gaps? What do you run into out there where there's still gaps uh, that we need to be aware of and, and try and focus on. I would say affordable housing is probably one of the ones we most run into. Just volume of housing. Um, yep. And just in this area, we have such a low vacancy rate. Mm -hmm. um, and so placing an individual who maybe has a number of barriers, who maybe would not be the best rental candidate on paper, um, makes it very difficult sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so we really have to work with those individuals to figure out how they can look better as they turn in those rental applications and how they're, they can, you know, access those rentals that really have multiple people trying, buying sure. for one place. Yeah. Um, I think some of the other challenges um, and gaps that we have is, is emergency shelter. Um, we do have an emergency shelter, you know, we have the, the Medford Mix Gas Commission, the Women's Gas Commission, same thing in the um, and they all do an amazing job, but they're not always able to meet the full demand. Um, another thing is transitional housing for women and children. I yes. think we have a big gap there. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and another barrier is the fact that a lot of people that are chronically homeless on the street do suffer from mental health and often mm -hmm. substance abuse as well. So it's very difficult to get them straight into um, transitional housing because um, most places have a requirement that they have some time clean and sober mm -hmm. um, and so that leaves them homeless until they can get some sobriety before they can get transitional housing and so that's also a barrier that makes it hard. And also one thing that might not sound important but it really is, is the, I mean, to the veterans and I know for sure is uh, places that would take their animals you know, a sobering place or whatever, you know, they will stay out in the freezing cold below zero mm -hmm. in, instead of, you know, give their animal to someone else or, or something. And a lot of them, it's their protection, sure. it's their companion, Comfort. it's, you know, yep. their social yeah. life is their Good animal. So that's, that's a huge piece mm -hmm. of the and is that a, a problem you run into in just the housing itself? Landlords that oh, yeah. don't allow pets, yeah. I yeah. assume, is. Nice, yeah. So then when you find places and you get close, you've got an animal issue here. Correct. Yeah. And in that housing, what I could use and what the Valley could use is a lot more one-bedroom units. We have a lot of single people, single vets, mm -hmm. and um, we can't put them into two or three-bedroom homes with this grant. Um, studios, too. And studios. 
that are pet friendly. I do. <laughs> it can happen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it can yeah. make that work. Hi. I just want to acknowledge. I just want to acknowledge another key partner sitting in here that's not at quite at the head table. The oh. Housing Authority of Jackson yeah. County, Scott Foster, and um, very good. Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer, sorry, Jennifer, coming up, senior moment. Uh, Jennifer, who are also really important partners in this effort. Um, they uh, they yeah. work very closely with everybody in, in this. Well, line. maybe they could share a few comments too, given yeah. the resources you have access to <laughs> and the challenges that you face. Not to like put you on the spot right now, but hey, why not? You on the spot. You want no, the lack of affordable housing affects all of us, and. The extremely low vacancy rate in the county really makes it competitive to find a unit. Mm -hmm. uh, we've managed to uh, build out in White City very close to the domiciliary uh, tax credit project that has 18 project-based vouchers in it that we've been very successful in stability of the mm -hmm. veterans population that have moved into those units. And we just got funded for another project in White City, similar with 18 project-based Spanish vouchers. Nice. But we won't break ground on that until the first of the year. Uh, so it's not an immediate mm -hmm. uh, source. I think Access is working uh, with Source to do a project on their property with an extended use lease from the Veterans Administration. Right. That uh, would be actually but that's something that actually yeah. has needs congressional approval, I think, to go forward, though. Oh no. <laughs> there you go. Not right this minute. But <laughs> we better get started. <laughs> In what respect? Um, well, there's an authorization. I, I don't really understand the, the, okay. the actual details of this, although I could get them. Yeah, um, but the project the process the project was stalled at one point about a year and a half ago because this this element was not reauthorized. It just was a ball that uh, fell off the right. table accidentally, really. And then eventually got picked up again. So, mm -hmm. um, and the, the domiciliary, like many, uh, by the way, I'm Jackie Shad, the director Hello, of Congress. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. I was a few minutes late getting in. Sorry. Um, uh, uh, the these uh, facilities that have lots of vacant land mm -hmm. are are under some mandate by the federal Veterans mm -hmm. Administration to make use of that land mm -hmm. to benefit the veterans in the community. Yeah. So it really came <coughs> off that sort of mandate. That they approached us about building um, building some housing out there, which which like I said, it's been a multi-year process, but we we think we're still going to get there. Well, if if we could follow up or with my sure. staff, Riley yeah. Shoe back here, yeah. um, it'd yeah. be good because you know we're in a period of some instability right. uh, in Washington, <laughs> if you haven't noticed. But right. everything's going to come to a head quickly at the end of the year, and uh, in the next few weeks or whatever, and there might be an opportunity to. Okay, I'll, I'll seize the moment of chaos and slip something in. Another thing that, that we're doing, and it's still in the planning stages and probably won't break ground until late next year, is a 30 unit uh, one bedroom uh, apartment complex in uh, West Medford that we're hoping to project these voucher, vouchers mm -hmm. in. But we're still uh, looking to secure the financing on that one. So. Things is, are looking up, but slowly. Is it hard to get the financing from the private side? Is that I'm sure we'll, I'm sure it? we'll be able to do it. Yeah. yeah. No, the private the private side is very willing to finance affordable housing in our area. All right. It's just a matter of uh, lining up the proper partner. That, uh, so when I was in Sisters earlier in the week, they were complaining that lack of ability to get financing for apartment projects, and they've got a big vacancy issue there too, access issue. But they were saying they couldn't. Get lenders to lend. Well, you can't go to a bank and get a loan, but there are there are various intermediary agencies that help us okay. package. Yeah. Or, Oregon I has a uh, a consortium of banks that have uh, given money to an organization called NOAA, the Network for Oregon right. Affordable Housing, and the banks fulfill their CRA Through Community that. Investment Act right. responsibilities by doing this. And the only thing this organization does is loan for affordable housing projects. Right. We should make sure that the folks and sisters know about it. I sit that. on that board too, so oh. Like, oh, we just go to you and get a loan. No, but this was a live issue two days yeah. ago in sisters. Yeah. They just yeah, you have to know a lot of the same issues right. in terms of values and other right. uses of the housing mm -hmm. and no apartments and that's what they need. Exactly. No apartments. Yeah. That's that's been our problem locally is that the market 
uh, wasn't favorable towards right. building multifamily right. housing in the last uh, 10 years practically. And I think Jackie and uh, at Access and the Housing Authority have been the only, uh, well, we've, we've been the major affordable housing developers in the county for at least six years now. Uh, and most of them depend on some sort of federal funding, mm -hmm. as well as. In order, yeah, for construction in order to keep the rents mm -hmm. affordable. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the work you thank did. Thank you. Also, with all of these people, it's not on the panel today, but that you might have heard discussed here a couple of times is Rogue Valley Veterans and Community Outreach. We work closely Perfect. with Access and the VA. This is Samantha Briggs, she's the executive director. Get on up there, girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no, you got to do it up here. You've been volunteered. Uh, no, we partner, no, we partner with Access with this grant for a subcontractor. We also have 40 beds in our grant per diem program, which Devin Shea is our liaison with. Um, and so we, with our grant per diem program, we work really closely to try to bridge uh, these veterans that are coming in to get them off the street, like Heather talked about. A lot of issues, trying to get them into transitional housing so we can push them into getting into the SSBM program. So it's been a, it's been a huge success and an amazing partnership, so. Good. Thank you for your work. Thank you for putting her on the spot. <laughs> Ah, oh, perfect. So, yeah, so I did, yeah, you know, Grove Valley Veterans and Community Outreach is a huge partnership and a huge piece of ending veteran homelessness in our area mm -hmm. through multiple ways, through our Grant for Diem program, through the SSVF grant, and just through their hard work and big hearts. Um, you know, I get, yesterday morning I got a telephone call about, you know, a, a veteran in really bad shape, intoxicated, and at home problem, and, um, and showed up at their door. They called me right away to do planning and we sat with them on the phone and created a, a plan for this gentleman. They brought veterans out who were in crisis that just happened. You know, they're a friendly place in town. Veterans learn about them and they show up there. Um, I'm also part of this other Oregon Outreach Coalition and we um, developed a Second Tuesday event where the second Tuesday of every month we um, do uh, an event for homeless veterans. Sometimes other homeless people in the community show up and they're welcome too. Um, it targets homeless veterans. Um, Pumpkin's Diner and Denny's, they don't oh, yeah, breakfast pumpkin. every month. Um, it's so good we breakfast. Have yeah, it's good. We have you know, free haircuts. Mm -hmm. um, we have some outreach materials. We have a lot of services there, including consumer credit counseling, Rogue Valley Veterans and nice. um, Community Outreach. As that event grew, um, Rogue Valley Veterans and Community Outreach allowed us to use their space. So now we, once a month, we show up with a big group right there at their building and they participate and um, it's a wonderful event. So they're big partners in the community. Yeah, Thanks. and it works out really well. I um, spend a lot of time just because I work so closely with the community agencies actually in their offices or buildings. Um, it makes a lot of sense just so when questions come up and, and it also increases access for veterans and so on those Tuesday morning events, it's nice because I do walk-in hours and outreach down there, and it's it's wonderful just to have if someone does show up, you know, they can link very quickly, and we can figure out where they need to go in the system, and either refer them over to SSVF, refer them into Grant Per Diem, refer them out to the source. Um, so it's it's a pretty um, neat way to move someone through a system in a very short period of time. It could even be a couple of hours to get them really set up to to be assessed for the program that's the best fit for them. Um, one of the things I kind of wanted to highlight too is we have seen a number of veterans. Habitat for Humanity, who's not represented today, does have a Habitat for Heroes program. And so um, they do home ownership. And so I work very closely with that agency as well. But we had one um, gentleman who came through the source for residential treatment first. He came through the Moore Center um, for stabilization at a point. We then housed him in Grant Per Diem um, for transitional housing for approximately a year, a year and a half. And then he went into his own rental, but it was somewhat substandard. And so he quickly was um, applied for the Habitat for Hero program and selected. And he now, um, for the last year and a half, has been in his own home wow. um, nice. that he helped build himself. Yeah, and so yeah. we've had a number of veteran families that have been chosen for that program, but it's, nice. 
it's pretty amazing to watch someone go from homelessness and living on the street to, to actually yeah. be a yes. homeowner and part of a community. Yeah. yeah, are there others here that are part of programs we haven't heard from but need to? Or? Um, as I introduce myself, I'm on the board of directors for Access, but my other hat is the general manager of Rogue Valley Transportation District. Mm -hmm. And one of the barriers, I kind of heard a little bit of it, but it's transportation. Yes. Yeah. And so they are facing, a lot of times, they're able to, to get housing for veterans, but it's in places where there is no transportation. And to, the affordability of a vehicle is, is affordable, especially if they're not employed or even if they are employed it's difficult um, I, I'm glad I came today because we do receive calls from each one of these agencies and collectively we've tried to help a little bit but there's not much Oregon has um, given RVTD 50 mil or 50 thousand 50 million I wish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, not the billion take care of here. everything fifty thousand dollars to serve um, medical transportation for veterans in a seven county area and if you can imagine seven counties and fifty thousand dollars, it doesn't go very far. No, right. But the but the U.S. government actually gave us a grant for a one-click, one-call center, where um, you can call and get information about transportation. The, the thing that I think the next step is we need to fund those those call centers that have been established um, throughout the the nation. And so. I, you know, one of the things that we would like to see is the affordability of transportation for veterans to be able to give them a bus pass or mm -hmm. provide the service that they need. So that is a huge barrier, yes. one that's kind of hidden, and mm -hmm. there's lots of workarounds. But David and I have kind of been talking, and I'm glad to hear you guys meet monthly because guess what? I'm going to come and try to help you out. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Yeah, that was on my list too. Thank you. Transportation yeah. is a huge, huge problem. Mm -hmm. And um, we do rely on the few bus passes people can get um, from the community partners and RVTD. And we do um, have a, we, we are able to purchase some tokens from them for our veterans, mm -hmm. but we, we do have a big problem with transportation. One of the issues too is, um, you know, or with getting people into housing, which that reminded me of, is, is when they don't have driver's licenses or state IDs. And, we are able to address that annually at the stand down. We have local judges, three of them that come from the community, and we have um, Division of Child Support because they can lose driver's license over that. And we have um, Department of Motor Vehicles with multiple agencies that come to the stand downs, and the judges work right with DMV to try to clear up issues to either get somebody a state ID or a driver's license. Um, and without the state ID, their birth certificate or social security card, they can't get housing. So that's another barrier that sometimes takes several months. Yeah, we passed legislation that the president signed into law uh, calling for the VA to issue a ID card for every veteran. Yes. Yeah, which heretofore hasn't existed. So right. yes, that right. that may help in <laughs> yeah. these areas too. And I did want to thank the Housing Authority. We talked a lot about HUD VASH and our 384 vouchers. Well, those vouchers come from the Housing Authority. So um, we're very grateful to them. It's a partnership, and the VASH part is, is the, the hands-on with the veterans and getting them housed and keep, trying to keep them housed, support them. Yes. Yeah. Sure. The programs that we do at Revco is we work with um, the different prison systems and uh, veterans that are coming out and coming mm -hmm. into nothing, you know, homelessness. And, uh, they show up and there's nothing here at the end of the line for them. And uh, Sam's been very beneficial in talking with and meeting with the uh, veteran convicts and felons mm -hmm. before they are released to set up a program mm -hmm. to help them have a place to land where they're safe, mm -hmm. where we can get them set up with their POs mm -hmm. and uh, a roof over their head and a bed to sleep in. Uh, the POs love us because we kind of take control of them. The guys have to work the program when they're within the walls of our houses. And, uh, and it's been really successful. We've only, uh, our recidivism rate was one in two or three yeah. years. Yeah. Really? We had one guy wow. go back to a bad lifestyle. Mm -hmm. All the rest of the felons that we have have just been exempt. They've just gone out and got jobs and 
so thankful for a second chance. Mm -hmm. It's a little piece in an aspect of stuff that we do that really you don't really hear much about. Really important. I'd like to expound on that. One of their clients um, in their GPD house came to us uh, for assistance. He had a <coughs> felony on his record um, for murder and couldn't get a job. So we helped him start his own business and now he's earning $10,000 a month, up to $10,000 a month with clientele. So wow. that's, that's been a real successful. <laughs> 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 Not bad. And when, I mean, I work closely on a clinical yeah, side with those individuals, but um, when you have someone coming out of an institutional system like that mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of challenges and sure. often if they've been incarcerated for a long period of time the whole world is different mm -hmm. um, you know we've had a number of gentlemen who've come in who did not even know about cell phones I mean obviously when they were incarcerated they found out but never really had access right. to those types of things that that we're when used to sure. daily mm -hmm. and so really working with them and having a good team who can kind of step in and and talk with them about any barrier they're facing because I mean it's shocking to even see the gentleman I've, I've worked with and how overwhelming it is to they want me to text or um, I don't know how to use a computer and so to have you know case management who can show them those daily living experiences that we all do um, to make them successful has, has been incredible to watch. Our Southern Oregon Public Television Station has been running a great series on returning veterans, some of the clients of these programs have yes. been interviewed on, the, on that mm -hmm. show. I watched one the other night where the gentleman said, I literally didn't know how to turn on a car. Right. And you have all these you know, clicks and gizmos on and not get the car started. Yeah. So it's a, it, is, it really is a different world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a long way from a key. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you all for what you do. It's incredibly important work. I don't have to tell you that. It's helpful to me to know what's working, what's not. I'm excited to learn that you know you might be able to actually get to virtually no homeless. I mean, you're always going to have some rotation here, but uh, the job never ends. But wow, if you can get it down to nearly zero by the end of the year, what a what a great holiday season for yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and yet we know there are other gaps. That you all are going to work on directly and we'll help where we can uh, in this pro well we'll help on some of these gaps where we can and uh, it's, it's actually pretty encouraging yeah. uh, and this is this is this might be the most rewarding thing we've done here in a long time um, it, but the great thing I think about this group of people is it's a culmination of relationships and work that we've done for so long you know uh, um, our wonderful colleagues in federal agencies uh, get together and decide that people should work together across agency boundaries and then that they deliver that message to the state and a couple of years ago I got a phone call from a state agency staff person who said would you be willing to work with the housing authority and I said well maybe what do you got in mind then I called after I hung up I called Scott and we just laughed for like 15 minutes <laughs> because it's kind of how we do things down here so so er er everybody in this room is a piece of it you know board staff volunteers, vets, um, it's just, it's a great, it's a great situation we have in many ways, even though we struggle with resources. So we thank you for your work on our behalf and thank everybody here. Yeah, thank you.